Sean Talent with the CFI Pro, and uh, we're going to click right along here with the FOIs this week, and we're going to continue where we left off uh, on Task D. So Task D deals with the uh, assessment and critique that we would have to do as an instructor. And so what are we looking at as an instructor in regards to assessment and critique? Well, uh, the very first thing we would be looking at is uh, define an assessment. An assessment is defined as the process of gathering measurable information to meet evaluation needs. You as the instructor are working with a client and you want to ensure that what you have said has been retained by the client. So what do you do? You ask questions, you give them tests, you give them assessments, that's what you do. And that's the point behind this, is to make sure that we actually do that as instructors, to make sure that we understand that our students are learning. However, it, there's a lot of other things that assessment and critique will help us with as well. Let's, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Assessment has a couple of purposes that we really want to take a good look at. One is to uh, identify student deficiencies. How do we know that the student has retained that? Well, you just ask a question. So if the student can answer the question, that means they are retaining the information. This is very important when we go to look at the level of progression with a student. How are they progressing? How are they uh, going from one point to the next? That's important for us to know, and assessment would be able to tell us that. One of the other things that's good about assessment is it provides feedback to your client, which I think is wonderful. Clients want to know. Students love to know where they are in their training. They love to know how they're doing. And assessment and critique is a great way of doing that. So why? Well, but it allows you and your student to be able to see how they're doing. And that's very important to the whole part of, of training. What you're also going to see is that assessment will contribute very heavily to aeronautical decision making and judgment skills. If you are out working with a client and you only give them one way out of things, they're only going to have one way out. If you are assessing properly and critiquing properly, then they'll learn to have multiple ways out of a situation. This is very, very important. If you remember how we talked about in the teaching aspect, the last lesson, you have many different scenarios. So if you present many different scenarios and assess them by their understanding by presenting them with different scenarios, they'll have more ways of being able to make the proper decision. So this ADM and judgment skills is very important. This will also help them to evaluate their own performance. So one of the, I think one of the best ways of evaluating a student is just to ask the student, say, hey, how do you think you did? and see if your way closely mimics what they're seeing in their brain. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. One of the things that this is great for for you as an instructor is going to help to see where more emphasis is need in the training. So if I give a test on, well, let's say FOIs, for example, it's going to be able to help me see what are you understanding more than other things. And that's very important. I know when I'm teaching this class, what to spend more emphasis on than other things. So that way I can help you better to learn the material. I know that because I've assessed people for so long through this. So when I'm given an assessment, the FAA and the Aviation Instructor's Handbook says that they're a good assessment or a general characteristic of a good assessment has specific characteristics to it. Our acronym here is you're going to be fast Coco. So fast Coco is general characteristics of an effective assessment. Fast Coco. So the first one here is flexible. Uh, flexible means that the instructor must be able to fit the tone, the technique, and the content of the assessment to the occasion. Now, if you uh, understand what this means, uh, then good for you. I when I first started learning this a long time ago, I had no idea what this meant. I mean, what do you mean it must fit the tone to the occasion? Well, it just means that when you are giving an assessment, uh, it cannot be, you cannot be hard on somebody in the young ages 
in the young uh, stages of their training, and you can't be easy on them in the uh, latter stages of their training, and so many other different ways. I have to fit the tone of the assessment to the occasion. And so with that, it just means that I can't necessarily assess the same way all the time. I have to know different ways to assess and different ways to critique and, and make it where it's right for the student. It also must be acceptable. This is a pretty big one. I think this is a huge one. How many of you in life have ever had someone say something to you and then you're like, Psh, whatever, I consider the source, move on about my business. I don't really care what he said. I don't care what she said. Well, that means that the assessment must be acceptable. If the student does not accept where the critique is coming from or where the assessment is coming from, it'll be completely worthless to them. They really won't care. So it's got to be acceptable. Specific. You have to be very specific in the assessment as to what the student did wrong. You can't be too broad in what you're trying to say like for instance you wouldn't say well your second landing eh, just wasn't as good as your first landing and then move on you have to be more specific in what you're trying to say thoughtful thoughtful takes us all the way back to Maslow's hierarchy this need for self-esteem kind of thing so when you are working with someone you're assessing someone where do you think the proper place to do a critique is or do an assessment or a critique on an individual should it be in, in front of their other classmates no probably not now there is a time in which you could make that a learning environment so if you're in a if you are in a group of students and you're all doing presentations together and you're having the presentations critique on it uh, the other presenters excuse me the other presenters uh, critique the presentation it is good for everybody to be in the room and listen to what things are going on because everybody can learn at the same time but if you're giving an assessment to someone you shouldn't go over that assessment what they got wrong and what they did wrong in front of a group of other people because it could be embarrassing that self-esteem is pretty big comprehensive uh, when we're looking at the word comprehensive you want to cover their weaknesses which is what this is designed to do as well as their strengths. A lot of people like to use some like a, a sandwich method where you give them like a positive and then a, a not so positive and then another positive to try to make them feel good. Uh, I am definitely not one of those everybody gets a trophy kind of thing. Uh, this is flight instruction in which you are teaching people how to live. Okay, this is not um, uh, hitting a, uh, uh, a double in a baseball game. I mean, this is this is something that you know how to do this or you learn how to do your trade or people may not make it through the flight. So when you're trying to be very comprehensive about things, I mean, excuse me, when you're trying to be, yeah, comprehensive about things, you want to be comprehensive. Cover everything. Cover everything that needs to be said. The next thing that we have is objective. No personal opinions here, people. Assessment should only be based on the fact. You may base your personal opinion, but you need to make sure that you let the client understand that it is based on personal opinion and they should understand what the FAA says and what the textbooks read and not base a lot of opinionated things on assessment. You should only be assessing on things that are fact. Um, no subjectivity here. Constructive. You know, if you're going to tell somebody what they're doing wrong, at least tell them how to not do it wrong. Build them up. Build them up. Never tear anybody down. This takes it all the way back to Maslow's hierarchy and human behavior and motivation. You can't demotivate somebody. you got to make sure you stay very constructive in your critique and, and build them and make them into something that's actually worthwhile. Organized. You know, when you're given an assessment and you want to imagine if I gave a written assessment and when I went over the written assessment, I went over it like this. All right, number seven, B. Uh, number 27, uh, D. Number 4 is uh, C. Does that sound at all correct and worthwhile uh, and organized? No, it does not. You would give it 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, on down. When you're assessing someone off of a flight that you've done, so you did a, pri a flight prior to someone, a flight prior to someone before they go on a check ride and you're assessing them for the last time. 
you probably want to make sure that you assess that in order. All right, now when we first walked out to the airplane, I asked you, did you have your weight and balance? And I asked you to show it to me, and you didn't have it. So you got to make sure you have your pre-flight planning stuff done. Now let's talk about your pre-flight. I noticed in your walk around, blah, blah, blah. All right, let's talk about your taxi. Now let's talk about your takeoff. Now let's talk about your climb out. Uh, we lost the engine on the climb out. Let's talk about that. And so on and so on and so on in that very organized fashion. When we are tr uh, assessing people, there is a, uh, a couple of different ways we can assess. Probably one of the main things, one of the main ways that everybody watching this video has had to deal with in their life is what we call traditional assessment. A traditional assessment is basically a written test. And, you know, like whenever you've got assessed on something or had to take a test in your life, normally uh, we've always done a written test. And um, multiple choice, matching, true or false, fill in the blank, all these are examples of things that we, ways that we would assess on a written test. And there's two different ways that we can actually, on a written test, uh, ask questions on a written test. And one is called a supply type question. And the other one's called a selection type question. Now, selection type question is probably exactly what you're thinking the name means. Selection. You had to make a selection. True, false. A, B, or C. Very, very easy. Circle the correct answer. Uh, very simple. It's a selection. A supply, a, supply, a supply type is a little bit more difficult. Uh, it's very subjective. These are your short answer and essay style questions. And what you can end up happening here is if you give this to one instructor and ask them to grade it and then give it to another instructor and add them to grade it, they may, you may not get the same grade. Why? Because of the subjectivity that's involved in uh, the grading of this lesson. So we want to try to stick with the selection type because we don't want that subjectivity of the assessment. Now, when we are writing an assessment, I want to write a test. Do we have to do this in aviation? Yeah, we sure have to do this in aviation as an instructor. Um, let's say that I have a, some of you out here have trained in what? Cessnas, archers, diamonds. Okay, cool. Those are the flat out standard training airplanes. And what's usually the first assessment that someone takes in these planes? Well, the pre-solo written test is usually the very first assessment that someone will get. Where do you get these pre-solo written tests from? If you say Google, you're probably 100% correct. Your flight school may have them. Uh, you could ask Jeeves, if you know who that is. Uh, so these are different ways you can get you a pre-solo written. But could you make one up? And the answer is yes. And here are some characteristics of a good written assessment when you go to make yours up. Um, the acronym here, Dr. Kovu, is the one who writes our lessons, our good written assessments. Okay. And the very first one is that the assessment must be discriminant. Now, discriminant assessment means that when it's the degree to which the test distinguishes between students meaning can we gauge somebody holistically off of how well they scored on a test and the answer is no you cannot uh, rate someone some of the best pilots I know are some of the worst test takers that I know uh, they absolutely positively just cannot uh, do a test, a written test. They hate them. And uh, frankly, so do I. Uh, I don't like written tests. I know how to study for a written test, which makes me a strong test taker in aviation. Probably not in other fields. It's been a while since I took one in another field. But, um, but I, I, I think that uh, I know how to take a test, so it's easier for me. But we can't judge someone holistically off the results of a written test. So we want to make sure that the, the written test that we're writing is very discriminant. And so it, it takes a while. You may not be able to, on the very first go, um, be able to design one. 
that is like that. You have to constantly evolve and make your tests better as you go along and start to write these tests and assessments. The next thing is reliable. So the more that you give your test, just like it'll grow in the way it is very discriminant amongst those who take the test, it'll also grow in reliability. So you'll be able to, uh, to change the questions, to manipulate the questions over time, and make it more reliable for what you're trying to evaluate. Why am I giving this test? Uh, every single time I give this pre-solo written, it just now happens, seems to me, that when, I, when I'm out there, the, the controller gives my student something that they've never heard before. And just on the last three solos, it's been this one item. Well, is the test very reliable? Well, no, not really. It may not be reliable enough, so I have to go in and modify it to make it more reliable for what I'm trying to test. Comprehensive. Comprehensive means how are we going to measure the overall objectives about what we're trying to do. So my pre-solo test, how do I make sure that it's comprehensive? Well, I know I've got to cover at least three things. The respective regulations of Part 6191 that apply to the student pilot. I've got to cover the airspace in which the student's going to solo in. And as I've also got to cover the systems on the aircraft in which they're going to be soloing in. So if my objective is to make sure they have enough information to solo, we don't want to go overboard as well. So we want to test them at what they need to know to make that. But it says... 6187 Bravo in the regulation says you only have to test on those three things that I gave you. So if you're if you're soloing someone in class Delta airspace, would you need to ask them about Charlie? Nope. Would you need to ask them about Bravo on the pre-solo written? Nope. Alpha? Nope. Special use airspaces? Nope. You would not need to know that. So you can actually go a little bit more. Uh, you can actually go a little bit above and beyond. And we don't want to do that. So it has to be comprehensive enough to, 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 call for, to, to satisfy the objective. Validity is something that it's taken me a while to really kind of uh, to deal with. I think a lot of instructors don't want to deal with other instructors and to know what other instructors think. If I say that my assessment is, has a lot of validity to it or is very valid, um, I have given that test to my peers and I have said, hey, can you please look at this and make sure that it's correct and right and true? And uh, it takes a while to do that. One is because instructors don't want other instructors to see what they're doing. I think, I personally believe that. Uh, a majority, I should say, a majority of the instructors don't want to see other people, don't want other people to see what they're doing. And the other one is because that nobody wants to be proven wrong or, or that, 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 you know, like, hey, did you see his test? Man, you showed me that test. That thing was, that thing was terrible. Um, and so you have to kind of grow out and go beyond that. And if you want your test to have a lot of validity to it, give it to your peers and see if it makes sense to them. Usability. Now I'm going to tell you about usability. I didn't give a dang about usability until probably about three years ago. Uh, and I uh, was studying the FOIs, and I was like, what is this usability? I mean, I, I, t I teach it. I know what it means. Um, it means dealing with the font, the wording, directions, graphics, easily graded. And I got to ask myself, you know, it was just because I had, like, multiple choice fill-in-the-blank questions uh, with one-word answers. Like, is, it, is, my test, is my test usable? So I just looked at the very first one, like, font. Is the font usable? I don't know. You know, I, I'm an 80s kid. So Courier 12 pitch is the font I grew up on. And then after that, I graduated to Times New Roman, I think is what it's called. So those are like what I, when I look at things, I'm like, yeah, I recognize that font. But I went out and, and, and took my test that I gave, my written test that I gave to students when I'm teaching these classes. And I picked... Uh, first off, I went to uh, the Google, and I typed in, what's the hottest new font? And I downloaded the top three fonts, which were not ones that I were using, because I was still stuck on Times New Roman, or Calibri, I think is what it was. Uh, might have been Arial. Not sure. Let's move on. Uh, but, I, but I 
created uh, or printed off my test in these new fonts and the spacing. And I gave it to a class, and I was very, very impressed that the class as a whole was able to identify one font, one font in which they all thought was the best way to look at it. And then on the next test, in the next class, I went through the spacing. So I used the font that the last class chose, and then I, I gave them a couple of tests to look at that had different spacings, single spacing, 1.5 spacing, double spacing. And it was very, very, very neat to see how all the stuff started to come through. Uh, and I went from single spacing to 1.5 spacing, and everybody seemed to like that better. And then I went to uh, the, the new hottest font, and I wish I could remember right now what that is. Uh, if I think of it before this presentation is over, I'll tell you what it is. But I've changed uh, my word. It's an Adobe branded font. That's the reason why it took me a while to get it, because I had to pay to get it. Downloaded on all my devices, thirty-nine dollars or something like that. But, but I got this new font, and it seems like everybody likes it. And uh, I wish I could remember what it is. And if I if I can before this is finished, I'll let you know what it is. But it's an Adobe branded font, and everybody seems to like it. And I've switched everything I have over to this to this one font due to the feedback on it. Uh, the other type of assessment that we have, in addition to traditional assessment, is authentic assessment. Now, authentic assessment is where I'm telling you to do something. I want you to do something. And we have this in aviation a pretty good bit. It's either like a, a, a stage check or a um, uh, something that happens before the final check ride. But also, it is the check ride. So in addition to traditional assessment, we also have another form of assessment, and it is called authentic assessment. Authentic assessment is where the student is asked to perform a real-world task. And this is basically like your check ride or your pre-solo evaluation or pre-cross-country eval or any type of stage check that you would have in a, a 142 or 141 course. And um, the student is forced to generate responses uh, from skills and concepts that they have learned through their training. So authentic assessment is probably the most important one in regards to getting a student ready to pass a check ride because you're actually asking them to do what is required from them on the check ride. And you're also making sure that along the way, even after the check ride, do they have the mental capacity to handle problems and issues and to make decisions uh, in order to make the, sci the, the flight very safe. So that is authentic assessment. Now, now, in regards to assessment, we have some very, very useful forms of assessment that we can use. And the one form that I like to use is something called the collaborative assessment. Now, the collaborative assessment, uh, the FAA loves this assessment. If you go to any type of FAA function in which they're trying to do CFIs things, uh, you will find that they always are, they are always going to mention the uh, collaborative assessment. Now, they're not going to actually mention it by name, but they'll actually mention it by the way that it's used. And they have four R's that are within this critique. And that is replay, replay, reconstruct, reflect, and redirect. So let's look at each one of those and find out how we would do this. Um, the very first one is you're going to ask your student to replay the lesson. Like, all right, walk me through the lesson and let's see what we did. This is going to be very helpful because you're going to be able to start identifying that difference between the instructor perspective way of seeing things and the student way of seeing things. And so this is very, very important. And if you're training someone in a program in which you know they're going to be an instructor later on, this is the most excellent way to do it because they'll start thinking like an instructor more early on in their training. Wonderful form to do this. Wonderful thing to do. So I would make them go through and do the replay so that way you can see the differences in perception. The next is called the reconstruct. Ask the student to identify what they could have done differently. They may have identify like uh, they did a steep turn and they lost a little bit more altitude than a what they should have called for in that lesson. So what could they have done differently? 
This is very important because if a person is not able to identify with their five senses and draw these perceptions and form proper insights, they're never going to learn how to do these maneuvers or learn how to do anything in these uh, in aviation at all, period, or in, in life in general. So you have to make sure that they understand what they should have done differently. Then you're going to ask them to reflect. So they've, they've told you, okay, I lost some altitude on this maneuver. Then you're going to say, why? Why did you lose altitude? And this is their, identify, this is their time to identify um, where either the sight picture was wrong or the entry was wrong, but where did they go wrong in this? And this is going to be play even more importance on the, on the next R. But they need time to be able to place meaning on the experience that they had. So they lost some, um, some altitude in the steep turn, and you're like, all right, good. So now we're, we, know, we know what we did wrong, and we've got to find a way to identify that in the future so we don't do it. And this comes in redirect. On the redirect side, the student's going to relate the lesson to other experiences and how they might help future sessions. So as you're saying, okay, you lost a little bit of altitude here. Why do you think you lost that altitude? And the student should be able to say, all right, so as I rolled into the turn to 45 degrees, instead of me holding back the back pressure to compensate for the loss of vertical component of lift, I allowed the nose to kind of fall through the horizon, and as I did, I started to lose altitude, and I never corrected back by leveling out my bank slightly within standards and holding the back pressure uh, to increase that load factor to hold my nose up more, increase the angle of attack to hold the nose up more. So you want to be able to have that, that whole entire experience to go through when they do that. If you get used to doing this, you will not want to do any other form of assessment with your student. It'll make uh, perfect sense for you to do these type of assessments all the time. Collaborative assessment. I love it. I think it's a very good form of assessment. So I like it. Very, very close to the most common form of assessment, which is called an oral assessment. Oral assessment is where you just basically ask questions orally. And you're not having it like, unlike the collaborative assessment where the student's kind of leading it, uh, you're kind of leading the oral assessment. And uh, you'll see that the oral assessment is probably going to be the best for revealing the effectiveness of your instructional standpoint. You know, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Do you understand what I just said? Yes? No? Okay, well, that's good. Um, you're going to be able to check the student's retention. How is the retention of this student? Is it good? Bad? Well, I just ask him a question. If he doesn't give me the answer that I want, then his retention is not as good. Because we just got finished talking about this. I like it because it helps me to very thoroughly review any material that I've already presented to the student. And I think students like that. I like to start off my lessons and go, all right, remember what we talked about yesterday? Let's talk about that. So tell me about... Uh, Tell me about load factor. What's load factor? And they tell me about load. But tell me about overbanking tendency. What's overbanking tendency in a steep turn? All right, very good. And so I think that's very, very important to to get that down pat. You can use it almost as a game, uh, which I like doing. Uh, if I'm in a class, I like to have uh, big bags of candy. And when somebody gets a question right, I like to throw out a, uh, some candy to the crowd. I think it's good. Make it almost like a reward system. Um, stimulating that thinking, you just can't go wrong with that. You know, you almost like a reward system uh, can be done by getting them involved with some type of reward system. Uh, it can emphasize the important points of the training. So I know we talked about a lot of stuff, but here's some of the key points and what we need to understand. It checks your student comprehension about what has been learned. Sure, they can repeat it back to you, but do they understand what has been said to you? That's the number one concern. Promotes active student participation, which is important to effective learning. This kind of goes back to what we talked about before, where we talked about the cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. So, if the student is actively participating, that is that affective uh, part of the training, and it's, it's left out a lot, and if you don't 
conquer that and, and learn how to deal with that, you know, you're not going to really be the top-notch instructor that you could possibly be. And it's pretty easy. You just have to practice your trade. So if I am going to ask a student question, like in an oral style setting, is there general is there like a, a characteristics of questions in which I should ask and the answer is yes uh, there absolutely is and the acronym that we have here is a B cap and a B cap or a B C a P um, tells us that when we are thinking about these questions or writing these questions uh, or asking these questions let me say that let me rephrase that so when we're asking these questions they should be A, B, cap. So first one, apply to the subject of instruction. If you shouldn't be asking questions about things that don't relate to what you're learning. That should be easy enough to understand. Brief and concise, but clear and definite. The answer shouldn't be too, too, I mean the question shouldn't be too large of a question. So brief and concise question, but make sure that it's clear and definite. Uh, question. Center on one idea with one correct answer. So we don't want to bring too many things in at once and have too much of a complicated answer at the end. That's the way I look at it. Adaptive to the ability, experience, and progress of the student. If you haven't talked about something yet, it makes sense that you're not going to ask questions about it. That makes perfectly sense, right? Yeah. But what if you were asking advanced things about something? Like what? Like what kind of advanced things would you ask? They know how a magneto works. But do they need to know the thickness of the P lead? No, they don't need to know that. Uh, I don't even think a lot of mechanics know that. But I've heard DPEs ask that question on check rides and it makes me want to slap the taste out of their mouth. Uh, I don't know why DPEs ask stupid, ignorant questions like that. It makes me so freaking angry I can't even, oh, I just sit there scratching my head trying to figure out why they're wasting valuable time with their client they're doing a check ride for asking crazy questions like that. Uh, the question should uh, the question should present a challenge to the student, though it shouldn't be very easy. And you, you can't really tell this up front. You have to start to know your student, and you have to understand uh, how their mind works and how their mind thinks before you can start presenting a challenge. Some students you can't present that hard of a challenge to. Some you can really go above and beyond. Um, you know, there's a difference when you have an engineer type person and uh, you have a non-engineer type person. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy how well uh, you can go into depth and detail with certain people and with other ones you can't. So no matter who they are, you want to make sure that it presents a challenge to the student. When we are asking questions, there are specific questions in which you should avoid. POTBIT is the acronym. So POTBIT is the types of questions to avoid. Number one, the puzzle question. Now, these are right out of the textbook. I really love these questions. I don't have them memorized. I'm going to have to look down and read them directly off, but I really like these questions, and I guess I could make up my own, but I just really, really like reading these questions. So I'm going to read you an example of a puzzle question. Um, so you're asking your student this question. Say, hey, student, come here. Uh, what's the first action you would take if you were in a conventional gear airplane and you had a weak right break and you're swerving left in a right crosswind during a full flat power on wheel landing. Huh? Yeah. Puzzle. What are the what are you asking? What's the question? Um oversize. Oversize questions next one. What do you do before beginning a flight? Wow. Well 9103 says you must be familiar with all available information. <laughs> That's like nine iPads worth of stuff. I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about like small iPads. I'm talking about like the big 512 gig iPad, like the big iPads. Uh, all available information, that's a, that's a lot of stuff. So that is an oversized question. You can't ask a question like that to a student. A toss-up question. Both answers are actually correct. Hey, what should you do in an emergency situation? Should you squawk 7700 or should you pick a landing spot? 
Yes, would be the answer to that. <laughs> uh, bewilderment. I like this one too. Here we go. <clears throat> In reading an altimeter, you know you set a sensitive altimeter for the nearest station pressure. If you take temperature into account, as when flying from a cold air mass to a warm front, what precautions should you take in a mountainous area? I'm waiting. Answer, please. Yeah. I have no idea what you're asking. What are you even asking? Trick questions. You know, when I first heard trick question, I just thought it was like a, like a, like a trick question. You know, like if a rooster's on top of a house and lays an egg, will it fall down the, this side or this side of the house? Roosters don't lay eggs. That's a trick question. See, that's what I thought. Who's buried in Grant's tomb? You know, things like that. But that's really not what it is. A trick question is where you can actually trick a person's mind to, to giving you the wrong answer. One of the biggest ones that I absolutely hate to see on a test is the not questions. You know what I'm talking about. Which of the following in the list below is not part of the PAVE checklist? It's a very high probability somebody's going to choose the incorrect answer on that. That's a trick question. It even says in the back of the appendix of the... Um, of the... Uh, Aviation Instructor's Handbook, to not write that in to the questions. But guess what? The FAA has those questions on their written exams. Oh, what a hoot. These, these folks, man, they're just so comical. Um, but a trick question would be like the not question, or it would be where um, you're looking at a, a test and you have uh, four different answers, and the answers are one, two, three, and four. And uh, you, you have a multiple choice, A, B, C, or D. But instead of putting A, B, C, D in the answer off the side, 1, 2, 3, 4, you put A, B, C, D, and then you put 4, 3, 2, 1. If the answer is 1, very, very, very high probability, the student would mark A as the correct answer because A is kind of synonymous to 1. So... That's an example of a trick question. The last one would be an irrelevant question. Irrelevant questions are just, they're irrelevant. They're not part of the test. Like if you were asking a question on tire inflation on a test that concerns the fuel system, it just it doesn't have any place there. So those are the questions to avoid. An acronym is POTBIT. What about responding to students' questions? We've talked about us asking questions. What about students asking us questions? How do we how do we how do we take care of that? Well, first off is make sure you understand the question clearly. I constantly ask people when they ask me questions. I'll say, could you repeat that? He asked that a different way. I, I may not be understanding what you're what you're saying. So uh, make sure you understand the the question clearly. Uh, display interest, even if you're not interested. You're going to hear the same questions over and over and over again and you don't just need to pop off go, God, man everybody asked that stupid question nope just display interest in the question because it's important to the client and they're paying you the money to do it so give a little answer should be direct and as accurate as possible don't get on some long whim about something else in tangent Determine if the student is satisfied with the answer. Does that answer your question? Good deal. If a question is too advanced for the student, the best thing to do is just say, you know, that's a great question. Uh, let's, let's talk about that after class. If you're in a classroom setting, if you're not in a classroom setting, uh, just tell the person, say, look, you know, we can talk about that after this after." Uh, your training is done. It doesn't have any weight right now. And I don't want you to fill your brain with some of these things. I've had people, you know, I teach a basic aerodynamic lesson and they start asking me all these questions like how does the F-14 climb vertically and stuff. And I'm like, I just throw them the Naval Aviator's Handbook and I go, just read that if you want to know. But it doesn't have any, doesn't have any weight on the archer. Okay, so... 
If a student asks you a question and you don't know the answer, just tell them you don't know the answer. For Christ's sake, don't lie to them. Uh, you don't need to sound that smart. You're already smart. Don't mask your intelligence with false things. Admit it when you don't know. I think that when you admit when you don't know, it makes you more real. It makes you more of a real person. I've been in this business for a long time, and people ask me questions all the time that I've never heard of. People think outside the box like crazy. And they'll ask me some, some weird question. I'm like, man, I've never even thought about that. That's, that's, that's crazy. And, it'll, and, the, and the thing has been right here in front of my face for years, and I've never looked at it like that. So don't get too much on your high horse. All right, take a little break, and when you come back, we're going to talk about critiques. See you in a minute. All right, welcome back. Now, now we're going to uh, finish up here. We're going to talk about some critiques that you can do. And the good thing about these type of critiques is that they're, they blend in more than just you in the critique. You can actually bring in other students as well or other outside people from that to, to blend in the critique. Now, in my general mind, I like to be able to, to draw a fine line between an assessment and a critique. An assessment is when you're trying to make like a it is literally a test an assessment is a critique on the other hand is helpful advice so sometimes you will see these words interchange back and forth like they're the same but they're really not so uh, uh, I like to be able to say if it's a critique if it's a critique if it's an assessment it's an assessment and some things you can go like a collaborative assessment or collaborative critique depends on how you use it but the name is interchangeable if that makes sense there are different types we have the instructor student critique we have the student led critique we have the small group critique we have the individual student critique by another student we have the self critique and then lastly is the written critique the acronym here is ISSISW Okay, ISIS W. And uh, this is a, if you want to make up a different acronym, you don't have to choose these acronyms that I have by the by. It's just that ones I've used for years. It's not a requirement. The FA doesn't have specific acronyms that they put out, but if you want to use it, you can. Let's talk about the very first different type, the first type of critique called the instructor student critique. So here's an example. I am leading a group of people in a class. I'm the instructor and over here is little Johnny and little Sandy. And I'll say, Sandy, come up here and present a lesson to the class. Sandy presents a lesson to the class. And then I'll go around the class and I'll say, okay, uh, Johnny, go ahead and, and give me your critique. And he gives his critique and then I give my critique and a couple other critiques for people in the class. And that is called an instructor-student critique. Okay? So, instructor will lead the group discussion in which the class members offer criticism. Class members offer criticism. Very key to understand about the instructor-student critique. Now, very, very close to that is something called the student-led critique. I'm going to ask the student to lead the assessment. Sandy comes up. I'm going to ask little Johnny to lead the assessment. So little Johnny's basically going to do my job, and he's going to lead the students in the way of critiquing and making sure that it doesn't get out of hand. Um, because the students are very inexperienced, you don't have a, a, an experienced instructor there to kind of uh, to mull over and, and disseminate about what's a good and a bad critique. So where is something like this really, really helpful? If, if I have to step out of the class for about an hour, I'm going to use the student-led critique to have little Johnny lead the, lead the presentations. The drawback on this, um, they may not be very efficient because there's no one there to actually, uh, a person that has a lot of experience to lead the assessment. 
but you will find that the students will be more interested in this type of learning and this type of critique and it'll stimulate thinking a little bit more because uh, they'll go into a lot more detail with the critique with you not being in the room as an instructor so it's a pretty good deal small group critique so I have little Sandy come up and I'm right, Sandy come up here and present this and I want you to present today on, and I need to have a multi subject or different gradable areas on a critique for this to happen so I'll say come on little Sandy come on up here and I want you to talk about the pedo static system and then I have a class let's say a 30 person class and I go alright you, you 10 people over here you're gonna you're gonna critique her just on the pedo so get together and critique and one of you will speak for the group this group over here in the middle you're gonna talk you're gonna listen to the static side you're gonna critique only the static stuff this group over here you're gonna critique just the common errors of the pedo and static system so in the end I have three different individuals stand up and it makes for a very 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 well-rounded assessment because they're only looking at very specific things and you don't end up getting the same response from every single student throughout the class pretty good stuff individual student individual student critique by another student Sandy is up here she presents and little Johnny is going to present the entire critique now some people may have a big issue with this. I'm going to tell you why I like it. I like it because if you ask a student to do this, how much ownership of the ideas expressed do you think are going to be given here? I think a lot. I think a lot. So uh, if, if you do that, you'll, you're asking the student to, to, uh, to have more ownership of their ideas, and it's probably going to end up being a lot better critique than if little Johnny had gave that same critique in a, with other people in the crowd giving critiques. So I like it. Self critique. This is the most common critique. You simply just ask the student, so how do you think you did? And there's a self critique. It's not like the four R's and the collaborative assessment. It's not like that. You're only asking just one thing. How do you think you did? And then that's it. Um, and you're going to be able to have them critique how they did, which is very effective because you'll be able to see that view between how the instructor feels about what happened and what the, instructor, what the student felt about. The written critique is the last critique that we're going to talk about. Um, I like the, the written critique. Uh, you know, when we're, when we're looking at critiques and you're looking at how things are done, um, the written critique has very has three very distinct advantages. One is it can you can be more thorough and personal than an oral critique. Why? Well, because when you have to go write something down, it is ten times better than what can physically come out of your mouth. Because it takes more thought process to write something down than it is just to speak it verbally. Um, the second one is. Um, the good thing about it is if you give a student a written assessment, they can keep it. So if I give it to them orally, then it's just like what they can remember. But if I give it to them in written, they can take it home and they can refer to them anytime and read over it. Um, and the third one is if I give it to an entire class of like 30 people, a little Sandy's up at front, and I make everybody in the class, including myself, write a critique for little Sandy she has 30 critiques that she can now go and look at so that's three advantages is there a drawback to that well the drawback is is that no other people in the class are going to be able to benefit from it because little Sandy has 30 critiques and everybody else doesn't know what everybody else said they just know what they said so it's not really a, a good deal there when you go to critique a student, there's definitely 100% some ground rules into how you're going to lead a critique or give a critique. First one, avoid a critique that is too lengthy. You don't want to get long-winded. 
Avoid trying to cover too much, just the facts. Give them almost like a borderline briefing. Avoid absolute statements. That landing just wasn't good. That's an absolute statement. You need to be more, give more information than that. Avoid controversies. If you're critiquing somebody on something, uh, if there's something that could be a controversy in that, uh, for Christ's sake, don't do it. Or be well educated enough so that way you can defend your, uh, you can defend the controversy. <laughs> and uh, lastly, kind of pending off that is, don't get in a situation where you have to defend your critique. So again, if you don't know enough about it, don't critique on it. Um, so this is uh, our way of understanding of assessment and critique. It's very important for a, a good instructor to understand about assessment and critique and to be able to use these tools effectively to make sure their student is where they are in their training and coming along very nicely in their training where they need to, where they where they're supposed to be. And um, I think that if you get really good at this, especially if you're working on your own, if you're an independent instructor, you start learning how to devise these tests a little bit more, it's going to make you a super duper instructor. One of the things that I'm currently doing right now is uh, I'm a very big Google fan. I like Google and I've been using written tests to work with my clients for years. I have something about a written test and printing something off paper and putting pen to the paper. I don't know what it is. I like it. But this is 2019, folks. This is 2019, and we need to step out of the Iron Age and move up to something a little bit better. So I've been using Google Forms to make and store all of my tests. And I've been transferring everything I have in paper over to Google Forms. And I've been given tests with this. And I absolutely love it. And the reason for it is because with a, with, a, with a program like Google Forms, it saves all the answers. And I have data that can be compiled over all of my tests. And I can see which questions are better, which questions are always missed. And it helps me to improve my style as an instructor. And I don't have a this much of paperwork over in the corner on human behavior and effective communication, my data on that one test, it's all in a digital file. So embrace the technology and it will make you a better instructor. I'm Todd Shellett with CFI Pro. Thank you so much for joining me. Without you, my patrons, this all would not be possible. Have a great week and we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. are uh, asking questions there are specific specific questions <laughs> <laughs>